continue along here in Matthew chapter 19 tonight. And of course, Matthew 19 there, beginning, uh, it's a parallel passage with Mark 10. If you want to just keep something in Matthew 19, go ahead and flip over to Mark 10 and we'll see a parallel passage. I'll read you from Mark 19, verse 1, where it says, And it came to pass when Jesus had finished these sayings, He departed from Galilee and came to the coast of Judea beyond Jordan. And great multitudes followed Him, and He healed them there. And the Pharisees also came unto Him, tempting Him, and saying unto Him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? So when we look over at Mark chapter 10, of course, we see a lot of the same uh, 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 statements being made. We see this very clearly. This is a parallel passage where it says in Mark 10, verse 1, And he rose from thence and came into the coast of Judea by the farther side of Jordan. So it's the same locality. Then you have the same people in verse 2. And the Pharisees came to him and asked him the same question. What is that? Is, that it, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife? Tempting him. Now, <clears throat> what's interesting about these two passages is that it kind of shows us uh, Jesus' model of ministry, like how, how was it that, you know, Jesus is our, our model for all things, and, you know, He ran a ministry here on earth, and those of us that run ministries or are part of ministries, you know, uh, what, how, what should we try to do? What is the end of our ministry? What is it we're trying to accomplish? And what we see here when we compare these scriptures with one with another is that, is really that uh, it's, it's healing and teaching are the two things, because these are both parallel passages, but if you look there in Matthew 19, it says in verse 2, And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. So in this passage we see that great multitudes are coming, and he's healing them. And of course he's referring to uh, you know, a physical healing. You know, the lame are walking, the blind are seeing, the deaf are hearing. You know, he's, he's causing the maimed to be whole. These great miracles that only God can do. So this is part of Jesus' ministry that he's healing people. And then of course if we compare that also in Mark chapter 10, it says there in verse 1, uh, towards the latter half, And the people resorted unto him again, and as he was wont, he taught them again. So not only was Jesus only healing, but he was also teaching. You know, not only was he just teaching, but he was also healing. So these are really two things that we need to think about when we uh, ask ourselves, you know, what is it that we should be attempting to do in our ministry? Now, of course, I'm not advocating that we should try to phys you know, heal people's physical ailments. You know, there are certain times when we ought to you know, pray for people that they should do better, you know, physic for their physical needs, the, the things that they're suffering physically. But I think really what we can apply this to is the fact that, you know, life has a way of beating people up sometimes. And that they are suffering, you know, spiritual things. They're suffering, you know, uh, you know, psychological things. They're suffering things, you know, in the spiritual realm. You know, they're spiritually hurt people. And we need to help them heal, you know. And, a, and a, a, the way that we do that, the way that we help heal people today in ministry is through teaching. I mean, that's, that's what we see here in Jesus' ministry. In these parallel passages, we see that only He's healing people, but He's also teaching them. And today, we would heal people by teaching them. Um, you know, right. healing comes through applying what is learned and what is taught. I mean, that's the whole point of coming to church. It's not just to come here to slap each other on the back and tell everybody what a great job we're doing. And, and there's a time for that, of course, to be an encouragement to one another. And, you know, we are doing a great job. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be part of a church that's Got people that are wanting to go out and knock doors on a consistent basis and, and, and preaching the gospel of the lost and, and, and reaching people. You know, that's of course we want to encourage one another, and that, that's not the only reason we come to church. A lot of times we come to church because, you know, there's there's struggles, there's trials, there's tribulations that we go through, and we have to learn things from the Word of God to help us through those struggles, to help us through those trials, to help us through those temptations that we're all going to go through in life. Amen. So, and there's a lot of things that people come through into a church, you know. We all have baggage. You know, a lot of us come in, we've come through a rough background, we've come from life, you know, no, no one's perfect. You know, our parents weren't perfect, our children aren't perfect. We have real struggles, we have real pains, we have real things that people are going through. And part of being a part of a church and being in a ministry and being involved in something is so that you can be, to some degree, healed of some of those things that you've gone through in life. You know, that, that there's a, there is a balm in Gilead, you know, and, and there... Amen. That's why we need to come to church and not forsake the assembling of ourselves together to be reminded that there is healing that needs to take place. And, you know, some people need it more than others, but they're all going to get it the same way. You know, I'm not going to take my jacket off and start slapping people, you know, and, and, and cause you, your arthritis to go away or sciatica or whatever you have. You know, that's not what I'm talking about. The healing that's going to take place because of the things that you're suffering are spiritual, it's going to be a spiritual healing. It's going to be something that's done through the teaching and the preaching of the Word of God. You know, it's not necessarily just the words of the preacher that's, that's preaching. It's the words of this book. You know, he's preaching this book. This is the balm. This is the word. This is what's going to help people heal. 
And, you know, if we read the Bible very much, or we've been under much preaching of it, we know that the Bible has a lot of negative things to say. So a lot of the teaching that's going to help us heal in life is not going to come in the form of, you know, uh, of gentle, you know, loving strokes. Sometimes it's going to be a little bit harder. Sometimes it's going to be, you know, a slap upside the back of the head. It's going to come in the form of reproof. It's not always going to be, you know, a gentle bedside manner from the Word of God. Sometimes it's just going to be, you know, someone just having to tell you that the way it is, and it's going to be hard. It's going to be, you know, a hard pill to swallow, you know, in order to get that to get that down. You know, the Bible does a lot of reproof, but we should have the right attitude about receiving reproof because it's reproof that's going to help us. It's reproof and rebuke that's going to help us to grow, to heal. To stop doing those things that have brought us pain in our life. To stop doing those things that have caused us to suffer. You know, we all want to heal, but are we going to stop doing the things, you know, that cause that that that, that pain and suffering to come? I went to the doctor and I said, every time I lift my arm, it hurts. He said, don't lift your arm anymore. It's, it's that kind of a thing, you know. Hey, you know, you know, Brother Corbin, you know, I, every time I go out and I do X, Y, and Z, you know, I, I suffer. Well, you know, the Bible says you shouldn't do X, Y, and Z. You know, the Bible says, you know, if you live this way, you wouldn't have to suffer that. You know, it's as simple as that. And if you would, turn with Psalms chapter uh, uh, 141. Psalms 141. Because the healing that's going to come to us is going to come through the preaching of the Word of God. And the Bible has a lot of negative things to say. And a lot of times it's very, it's contrary to our own nature. You know, it's contrary to us. It's a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. You know, the, the, when the law came and sin revived and I died. You know, it's not always a good... Uh, feeling that we're going to get. But the Bible says in, in 2 Timothy, it says, preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. So that's two negatives and then a positive. There's a lot, there's reproving and there's rebuking. And yes, there's exhorting. There's time to encourage. There's time to, to, to tell people, you know, the good that they're doing and to continue in those things. But there's also a lot of reproof that's going to come. There's also a lot of rebuking that's going to come. Especially when we've been growing up in a culture and a society that has been teaching us things that are contrary to the Word of God since day one. Right. Since we've been, you know, if we've been in the public school systems that have been telling us things that don't line up with God's Word, that are contrary to work God's Word. You know, the, when we get under the preaching of it, you know, it's not always, it's going to rub the cat the wrong way. You know, it's going to rub the fur the wrong way. Well, you know, in that instance, the cat just needs to turn around and just, and, and take it. But you're there in Psalms 141. Look there in verse uh, uh, verse five. It says, "Let the righteous smite me, and it shall be a kindness." I mean, that's kind of a strange thing to, to say to somebody. I mean, if somebody were to just come up and smite you, if I were just to walk up to one of you and just, you know, and say, "It's a kindness," you know, is that, is that the first thing that's going to go to mind? Well, thank you. <laughs> you know, thank you very much. Could you get the other cheek? You know? Can I get a Can I get a brother to help me out with the other side? You know, that's not what you're going to say. You know. I don't want to know what you'd say. You might say something kind of nasty, right? You know, that might be our first inclination. Like, you know, what are you doing, you jerk? But what does he say here? Let the righteous smite me and it shall be a kindness. And is he talking about necessarily a physical beating? No, he goes on and says, and let him reprove me, it shall be an excellent oil. You know, the words of reproof, that's the, the, therein is the way of life, the Bible says. You know, that's, that's how we receive wisdom and understanding. That's how we receive healing. It's through the teaching. And that teaching often comes in the form of reproof and rebuke. You know, and if you're in a church where the whole counsel of the Word of God is being preached, it's only a matter of time before the, something is preached that is going to apply directly to you and it's not going to feel good. You know, we've all been there. If we've all been in a church for any length of time where, where the Word of God is being preached in its entirety, there's going to be times where it comes down and it, and it causes us to feel a little uncomfortable. But we have to remember that it's an excellent oil, that it's a kindness when we're being reproved by the Word of God. Which shall not break my head, for yet my prayer shall also be in the calamity. So, you know, we see here two elements to Jesus' ministry. We see healing and we see teaching. And today, that's how the healing comes. It's through the teaching. It's through the reproof and the rebuke and the exhortation. And, you know, we may have to suffer hurt in order to heal. That's a that's a big part of, of you know, of, of the Christian life. You know, sometimes we have to you know, reap what we've sown, and we have to suffer, and sometimes we have to suffer in order to heal. I mean, you think about, you know, taking medicine. I mean, I know nowadays that they're all, you know, bubblegum flavored and everything like that, but I, I'm just old enough to remember when cough medicine was terrible. You know, my mom had to pinch your nose, and first she had to pin you down, 
<laughs> then hold your nose and pour it in. You know, we didn't have you know great flavored Robitussin or anything like that. You know, or any of these other fancy flavors or. You know, now they're taking, you know, kids are taking, uh, you know, candies. It's a vitamin, but it tastes like candy, you know. Mm -hmm. But medicine often is very bitter. I mean, sometimes medicine has very bad side effects, you know, but it, it's necessary in order to, to heal from another ailment. We have to take these things. I mean, you think about somebody having to go through bed rest. I mean, that's, that's got to be pretty cool. <coughs> you know, but sometimes that's what's needed is just to go through something difficult, to go through something uncomfortable. You know, you think about a lot of times how... If someone breaks a bone and they don't go see a doctor and have it properly set, and then they get taken care of later, sometimes they have to re-break that bone. They have to say, hey, you know, this bone didn't heal right. We're going to have to break it again. I mean, can you imagine having somebody intentionally break your bone? But the point I'm trying to make is that sometimes we have to suffer in order to heal, whether it be a physical ailment, but more importantly, spiritually. Sometimes we have to come to church, and the preacher has to preach on something that we don't like to hear or applies to us a little too closely, or it's a hard thing that have, we have to receive. There's a hard saying, and you know that. But that's part of the Christian life. That's part of growing in Christ. That's part of the healing process in the Christian life. And of course, this passage deals with a subject that a lot of people find very uncomfortable, and that is the subject of divorce and remarriage. It's not a popular one. It's something that a lot of people, uh, you know, would rather probably not hear about. And quite frankly, it's one that a lot of pastors and preachers today don't want to touch with a ten-foot pole. Or they have a very misconstrued or mis, uh, they have a very bad understanding of what the proper uh, you know, teaching is on the subject. They have a lot of false doctrine on the subject. So it's important that we, we preach on this. And let me just go into saying this. You know, if it applies to you tonight, you know, I'm not trying to pick on anybody. I'm not trying to get up here and just make people. I'm going through the book of Matthew, chapter 19 tonight. I'm going chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And that's what's here tonight. And that's what I have to preach. I can't just skip over this. You know, you know, not just to, to spare people's feelings, because you know my child's here tonight. I want her to hear this preaching. You know, I come from a broken home. My parents got divorced. You know, I know the consequences that come from that. I know the things that I've suffered in my life because of that. I certainly don't want that for her. I don't want that for her children. I don't want her to grow up and think that divorce and remarriage are just fine. That God's okay with that. You know, we've got other kids here. I love the kids and the, the, those that have not yet made this mistake enough to get up and preach this. And even if it makes other people feel uncomfortable, you know, but here's the thing, let the righteous smite you, you know, and it will be a blessing. You know, it will be an excellent oil. You know, these things have to be preached in order so we can heal and so that people can get right with God and avoid making mistakes. So the hard truth is divorce and remarriage, you know, and if we had a proper understanding of the subject and if pastors and preachers would get up and preach the subject the way it ought to be preached, you know, it would probably would save a lot of people pain today. It would probably spare a lot of people that are suffering today from this that they wouldn't have, they would, they would have made different decisions in life. They said, if I had known that, you know, I would have been more careful about who I married, or I would have been, I would have put more effort into my marriage to, uh, you know, make it last. Because they see when we, they start to understand the severity of this subject. It's a very serious subject in the Word of God. Because you have to remember that's what they're asking him here. They brought it to him, right? They're coming to him. They're saying in verse 3, The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Right? And you've got to see where their heart is. You know, and that's it's kind of our culture today. People just get divorced at the drop of the hat today. Yeah. For every cause. She burned the muffins. <coughs> you know? He never changes the oil in the car. I'm out of here. You know, whatever. They have all kinds of excuses today as to why they just, they, we don't love each other. Just whatever it might be. And they want to know, is it for every cause? And we'll see here that uh, he only gives one cause. And it's a very rare exception. You know, and I, and I, would, I would venture to say that it, it wouldn't apply to 99% of people who have gotten divorced today. And he says there in verse 4, he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? So they're asking him, you know, is it lawful to, for a man to divorce his wife? And he's taking, he doesn't take them back to Moses. They go back to Moses here in a minute. But he takes them all the way back to Genesis. He takes them all the way back to the very beginning, as he says there. He which made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they that are no, they are no more twain, but one flesh... What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. I mean, the Bible could not be any clearer. 
He's saying here, look, divorce is not an option. Let not man put asunder. What God has joined together, when a man leaves his father and mother and cleaves unto his wife, that union is to be permanent. It is to never be broken. And many men today, they put asunder that which God has brought together, don't they? I mean, that is the vast majority. I mean, major most people are getting divorced today. That's the sad reality of our country. And why is it? Why is a big reason for that? Because people don't want to preach this. Because people are too worried about hurting people's feelings and not sparing the next gener generation of that same mistake. They don't want they you know they don't want to preach on that because you know that's that's money bags. That's he's the one that's putting the offering in the plate. He's divorced. I can't touch that. You know, half my congregation is divorced. I can't preach on that. They'll all leave. You know, and here's the thing: a lot of people they appreciate this truth, even if they have been divorced. They can still understand and say, you know what, the Bible's right. Yeah. And they have more respect for a person who'll stand up and actually preach it than a guy who's just going to compromise. Yeah. So this fear is unfounded for the men, for preachers to get up and say, well, I can't preach that. Everyone will get upset. Well, even if they did, so what? You know, we ought to obey God rather than men. Mm -hmm. Amen. So if we obeyed men, you know, I would not, I, you know, I would not be the servant of Christ. You know, if I were to sit here and consider and have respect of persons and regard uh, people's persons over the Word of God, that wouldn't be a good thing. And that's why we see many men today put asunder that which God has brought together because it's not being pe being preached, it's not being taught, it's not being extolled and, and, and put in its proper uh, place. And giving people the proper perspective on marriage, you know, before they even go into it, you know, and, and, and understanding what it is that they're getting themselves involved in. But, you know, this, who are the men that are putting away uh, today, who that are dividing asunder? Who are the men that are doing that? Well, obviously, it's the spouses themselves. It's the people that have gotten married. You know, they're they're the probably the you know the first ones. That you'd have to say, well, they're to blame. They're the ones that are putting asunder. You know, and they get into this he said she said thing, but that they're that blame falls on them. The divorce courts and lawyers. You know, let not man put asunder, thou judge. You know, thou two hundred dollar divorce lawyer. I mean, that's how that's how bad it is. And it's funny that you find these signs, two hundred dollar divorce, in some of the most low income places in Phoenix. You don't see them when I'm driving around Ahwatukee. I don't see them when I'm driving around Chandler and parts of Gilbert. I don't see them over there. But when I'm in South Phoenix, when I'm in North Phoenix, when I'm in the lower income places where people are struggling financially, where people are having to deal with drugs and serious issues, where divorce is running rampant, that's where I see men who are more than happy to put on a suit and tie and put a, a, site, a sign on the ground and say, I'll put a sun that which God has joined together for 200 bucks. I'll represent you in court. You know, woe unto these people that are, are taking advantage of, of people like that. Mm -hmm. You know, who else puts people asunder that God has joined together? Friends and relatives, right? You know, that's why we should never talk trash about our spouses to anybody, ever. And if anybody ever talks trash about your spouse to you, I mean, you should instantly come to their defense. It, shouldn't, it should be second nature. You know, I, I, I don't think anyone would do that, but I'm, I'm sure it happens. I've never seen it happen. I'm sure it does. But I'll tell you what, if somebody ever came and said something about my wife, even if it had a grain of truth to it, I would say, yeah, you know, you're right. She is like that. She does do that. You know, what, that's, that's, a ter that's a wicked attitude. Because what that's going to do is start to foster, you know, other thoughts, other feelings of animosity towards that spouse. And, you know, the, the friends and the relatives come. The mom and dad get involved. You know, the newlyweds get married. He raises his voice one night. Oh, no. And it goes running back to mom and dad. Oh, just come on in, honey. Come on in. It's okay. We know he's mean. And, and, and you, you can leave him. It's all right. You can come stay with us. Bring the kids. You know, get rid of him. You deserve better. You know, you're our little princess. You know, that's, that's not how it's going to work in my house. You know, my daughters get married. You know, mark it down, Karen. You get married one day, you're stuck. <laughs> you come over to my house and say, he's this, he's that. I'm going to say, well, you married him. Go back to your husband. And that's that's how we have to look at these things, you know. And, and woe to those, you know, friends and relatives, you know, going to work and saying, talking trash. Oh, girl, you need to get a better. You can get a better man than that. You need to drop him. You need to get a better man. You can do better. I mean, people talk like this in the workplace. They will convince you to get a divorce. They will do their best to talk you into getting a divorce from your spouse. They have no problem putting asunder that which God has joined together. You know, and even, unfortunately today, even pastors and fellow Christians, people will come to pastors and say, hey, this is going on in my marriage. They say, well, you know, you should probably leave them. They'll encourage people to leave their spouses. I'm sure they'll say, well, let's try counseling or something like that. 
But you, I, there are pastors out there who they have a threshold. They have, they probably have a checklist. Well, we'll try this, this, and this, but divorce is on that list. Well, you know what? Leave them there. You know, get get rid of them there. You, know, you, sh you should move on. So, you know, there's a lot of people out there today that are willing to put asunder that which God has joined together. But, you know, let that not be said of us. And, of course, they didn't like that answer, right? And a lot of people don't like that answer. People want to hear, yeah, it's okay. You know, I understand. Uh, your spouse is this way. So-and-so, they did this, they did that. You know, you're totally justified. You should get a divorce and move on with your life. That's what they would rather hear. And when Jesus gave this answer, that's exactly what the Pharisees wanted. It says there in verse 7, They say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement to put her away? He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. So, of course, they're referring back to Deuteronomy 24. If you want to turn there, we're going to go to Deuteronomy 24. They're referring back to this clause that, that Moses gave in the Word of God. Remember, he didn't give it because it said, why did Moses give this clause? Because he's being a nice guy? Because, he, because he's very understanding that, that there's, you know, that in some, that this certain instance that, you know, it's best to put away your wife? No, it's because, because of the hardness of your hearts. Your unwillingness to see past somebody else's shortcoming or somebody else's failure or fault and to just live with that person and love them in spite of that. He says there, so what is it that he's referring to? He says there in Deuteronomy 24, verse 1, When a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, because he hath found some uncleanness in her, then let him write a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send, him, send her out of her house, out of his house, and when she is departed out of his house, she may go be another man's wife. So here you have this one instance, okay? Now, this is not adultery. You have to remember, this is not referring to adultery. This is, that's why Jesus says in verse 9 of Matthew chapter 19, And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. He didn't say whosoever shall put away his wife, that commits adultery. Right? He said whosoever shall commit fornication. You cannot commit fornication within marriage. Okay, so we have to understand what this passage is talking about. It's talking about when a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, because he hath found some uncleanness in her. What this is specifically referring to is that a man marries a woman under the impression that she is a virgin, that she is clean, that she is pure, and then finds out on his wedding night, or shortly thereafter, whatever comes to light, that she, in fact, is not a virgin on her wedding night, that she had been sleeping around. This is the one instance. Now, how often do you think that's taking place today? How often do you think a, a guy is unknowingly thinks he's marrying a virgin today? In all likelihood, they've been together multiple times before they've gotten married. And, 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 yeah, before they even got married, or even before that, he already knows that she's been with other guys. And they don't have a problem with it. And fine, whatever, you know, I'm not going to go off on that, but the point it's trying to make here is that this is the one instance that it allows. And I guarantee you, this is not what's being exercised today. That's not why over 50% of people are getting divorced today. Because they're getting together in a wedding night and finding out, you know, she's unclean. That's not what's going on. All right? This, this is a very rare instance. And again, it was the one cause God gave. Why? Because of the hardness of their hearts. Because God knew that if, they, if a man found out about this, you know, he was going to have a hard time getting over it. And understandably so to some degree. But again, it's a hardened heart thing. You know, the, 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 ideally what would have happened is he would have been like, you know what, uh, I married you because I love you, you know, and this is a big breach in trust, obviously. You know, that might be a really hard thing to get over for someone to lie to you or try to deceive you in that area. But it's, again, the best thing would have been to just forgive and go on. But the point I'm trying to make here is that this is not adultery. And a lot of Christians today will say, well, I'm justified in leaving my spouse because they committed adultery. But that's not, that's not what it's saying here. Because adultery is not fornication. Now you say, well, what's, what's the adulterer supposed to do? Well, they're supposed to, they, you know, the really thing you can do is forgive. And that's, I, you know, I, I, I've never had to go through that pray, and pray and never will that I'll have to exercise that to forgive my spouse for committing adultery. You know, that kind of thing happens. I mean, I'll be seeing red. I mean, there might be some blood getting shed. You know? And that's a hard thing. To, uh, <laughs> that's something, the Bible talks about that. You know, A man, you know, he's not having mercy. 
when he finds out that his uh, his his wife has been sleeping around, and that's that's a serious thing. And when you look in the Word of God, you know, in the Old Testament, when the spirit of jealousy came upon a man, and he even suspected his wife of committing adultery, he was to take her to the priest, and he would give her that bitter water, and if the thing was true, her thigh would rot. I mean, the Bible. I mean, that's a serious thing to sit there and think that your wife might be committing adultery on you. But what? So what's the option today? For the person who has to go through that, where the spouse has committed adultery, is it divorce? It's not. That's this is the one clause we see here, and it's not it's not adultery. It's to forgive. That's the only option you have. Now I will say this: the adulterer, you know, in the Bible, in the Old Testament law, you know, if we were upholding righteous and holy and godly law today, the adulterer would be put to death. I mean, put you know, try that on. I mean, and you say, well, that sounds cruel. Yeah, but you know what that would allow is for the person who was uh, you know cheated on. The adulterer, you know, they would allow them to move on with their life. Mm. Right. I mean, I'm not saying it would be easy. I'm saying there'd probably be a lot, of, a lot of emotional pain and trauma. It's not like just taking out the trash. But that's what the they, I mean, think about it. That would be what would take place. You know, the husband, the wife goes out and commits some adulteries, but sleeping around, it's found out, and now they have to live with this person. Or, you know, the cat, the government. I'm not saying we do it. Not vigilante justice. But the government, you know, a righteous and holy government would have that person put to death. And then that person moves on with their life. You know, and you say, well, that's, that's, that's not very good. You know, I don't, I don't agree with that. Well, you know, there's a lot of instances where that would be the best option. I mean, I don't know how many times you hear about people who marry somebody and the husband turns out to be a pervert. Turns out to be a sodomite. Turns out to be a child molester. What's that person supposed to do? Divorce isn't an option, folks. But we just looked at the one clause. But those people are supposed to be put to death, aren't they? The sodomite, the pervert, the pedophile. And that would allow that person to move on with their life. But you know that but the but our world knows better today. You know, they they they've got they have a more humane way, they have a better way of, of being able to figure this all out through the divorce courts and alimony and child support and you know, visitation rights and everything like that. That's that's a much better way for people to just you know continually have to put up with somebody for rest for the rest of their life. But you know, this is the word of God. This is what it says, and people can like it or lump it. Um, you know, Jesus gave one exception, and today that's not the exception that's being exercised today. <laughs> he says very plainly, "Whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery." And it says there in verse nine, Who, uh, oh, "I say unto you, whoso shall put away his wife and shall marry another, committeth adultery." So you need to go into marriage with the idea that divorce is not an option. And understanding that if you get divorced and get married, you're committing adultery in the eyes of God. That's what the Bible says here. Now, if you're someone tonight who has gotten a divorce and have, have gotten remarried, I am not saying that you are in a continual state of adultery for the rest of your life. I'm saying you've already committed that sin. And Well, what's the answer for you? Confess that sin, forsake that sin, and stay married to the spouse that you have, and don't make that same mistake again. You know, And, and God you know, was long-suffering to us where... And you know God is, uh, you know, He's very slow and merciful, and He's ready to forgive. You know, if we confess our, uh, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if you've made that mistake, just confess it and acknowledge it. You know, say, you know, the Word of God is right. I've, I got divorced, I got remarried, I've committed adultery, and God forgive me, and then move on with your life. I'm not saying that for you know, because some people teach this. Some people teach. That there's this weird doctrine out there that if you've gotten divorced and remarried, you need to leave that spouse and go back to your original spouse to be right with God. Well, the Bible here, if you're still there in Deuteronomy, uh, if you're still there in Deuteronomy 24, it says, uh, I don't know if I'm getting the right passage there, but it, it says that very clear in the Word of God that you are not to return unto your original spouse. Sorry, Pastor. Deuteronomy chapter 24. Yeah, I get there myself. I didn't have that whole thing written down there. <clears throat> yeah, it says here in verse 2, and if she is departed and out of his house, she may go be another man's wife. Of course, that's giving that what that one clause that God gives. That on that wedding night, you know, not 20 years later, oh, by the way, when we got married, she was virgin, now 20 years later, when it her. No, it's in something when you find out, you immediately take action or you don't. So that's the one clause that she has not kept herself pure to her wedding night. You know, if she if that's found out, then she you can be put her away, and then she can go be another man's wife. And if the latter husband hate her, or if the next guy uh, doesn't like her, she goes out and gets married, and it turns out that he doesn't like her either. Verse 3, and if the latter husband hate her, 
and write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand, and send a third out of his house, or if the latter husband die, which took her to be his wife, her former husband, which sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife. I mean, it's right there in the scripture that if you divorce your wife, you can't, and she goes out and marries another, you can't take her back. If that, if the second husband dies, he can't take her back. If if she goes out and marries another, and the second husband divorces her, he can't take her back. Now, if you now here's the thing: you can be reconciled to your spouse after divorce. If you get divorced and 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 you haven't married another and your spouse hasn't married another, you just stay divorced, you can of course be reconciled. Okay, there's that. But you can't go out, and why is that? Because you don't want to start, this is how disease spreads. This is how, you know, people start sleeping around with each other, you know, and this is how you, you start having a lot of difficulties in society with families that are getting mixed. There's just a lot of difficult situations that come into play at this point. So God knows best, and he's writing, I mean, doesn't, the Bible addresses every single circumstance in life. Even down to our marriages, even down to our divorces, even to how all these things are supposed to be handled. But the one clause for divorce is very specific. It's fornication and it's not adultery. It's, it's, it's fornication and it's not adultery. Fornication and adultery are two different things. You know, we see examples of this actually being taken place where this was actually worked out. Where 20, Deuteronomy 24, uh, 1 was actually practiced in, uh, if you recall, in Matthew 1 at the birth of Christ. You know, on their, before they were come together, Joseph and Mary, she was found the child of the Holy Ghost. And Joseph, being a just man, decided to put her away privately, not only to make her a private example. It says he was a just man to put her away because she was found with child of the Holy Ghost, meaning she was not a virgin. Well, he thought that. Of course she was a virgin. Excuse me, let me clarify. We believe in the virgin birth here, okay? <laughs> but she was found, when he, his first impression was, I'm marrying uh, this virgin girl, and she, it turns out before we're even come together, you know, physically, she's found with child. What's, what's your first instinct? You know, I don't think any man's going to go, well, this must be the hand of God. <laughs> no man's going to think that. He's going to instantly think, you know, who you been with? You know, well, that, you know, wedding's off. Sorry, you're no longer my wife. I'm putting you away. That's why it says he was a just man to do that. Because in that circumstance, and that's why the angel had to come and say, you know, Joseph, you're not to take unto that marry thy wife. For that was conceived of her of the Holy Ghost. If you remember, the, the, spirit, the angel had to come and, and tell him what was going on. And there, and then he then he took her in. <clears throat> so it says here, and of course, what's everyone's reaction to all this? This is a hard saying, right? Well, look at verse ten. And his disciples say unto him, If this be the case of man of the man, uh, if the case of the man be so with his wife, it is good not to marry. But he said unto them, All men cannot receive the saying, save whom it is written, or whom it is given. So I, I you know, I've always kind of had a hard time ex exactly understanding who Jesus, what saying he is referring to there, verse 11, where he says, all men cannot receive this saying. You know, a lot of times I'll think, well, he's talking about what he just said. But I think when we look at verses, uh, when we look at verse 12 and on, it kind of, verse 12 kind of gives me the context. It makes me think that he's actually saying, it's what the disciples said that is a hard saying, that a man, that it is not good to marry. And he's saying, all men cannot receive this saying. What's the saying that he's referring to? That it is not good to marry. That's how I interpret. That's what, you know something I've kind of. I might be wrong, you know, and I'm open to correction on that. But that's what I think he's saying there, is that all men cannot receive this saying that it is not good. That it is good for uh, not to marry. And the same who do is given. Of course, verse 12 goes into eunuchs. You know, men that have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. It says there, in verse 12, for some men are um, eunuchs which were born so from their mother's womb and some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men, and there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake, meaning they've chosen to remain celibate. You know, they haven't physically castrated themselves as in, you know, the, in the one instance here. I mean, that's what it is to be a eunuch, is to be castrated. And that was something that, that kings would do in ancient times, that if they wanted to have male servants around, you know, their, their, their wives, their concubines, that they would castrate them so that they couldn't, you know, pollute the, you know, the, the monarchy, the holy seed, or whatever they wanted to call it. You know, they wanted, they wanted to make sure nothing was, there was no funny business. So, that doesn't sound like a very good job, but, you know, that's what took place. But what he's saying here is that some men have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He's not saying that they literally castrate himself. He's saying that they've decided to remain celibate. As Paul, you know, Paul is one who did not marry. 
You know, he said, I had the power to, to lead about a sister or wife. You know, but he chose not to for the kingdom of heaven's sake because it's true that a man who's not married is free to do other things. That he's free to go out and do uh, things that it would be much more difficult for a married man with a family to do. Yeah. I mean, there's not, there's no, there's no degree amount of the same responsibilities a married man has. You know, I mean, he, he has a lot more on his plate. He's got to provide for a family. He's got to provide for children. It's a lot of responsibility to be a married man and raise children. Whereas if someone says, hey, I'm not going to make, be married. I make myself, you know, spiritually a eunuch, you know, figuratively speaking, for the kingdom of heaven's sake, you know, he's going to be a lot more free to just go sleep in a tent under some the, the stars in Africa and win souls, you know, or something like that. Like, we've got... We've got the twins up in Phoenix, you know, the, the, the two, the McPhail twins. They're going over to Uganda to, to minister over there. They, they, they're not married men. You know, and the, I don't know, you know, what they ever plan on, on it. Maybe one day I'm sure they're, they're open to it. But, you know, for the time being, they've said, hey, this is what we're going to go do. Their heart's desire is to go out and go to a foreign land. It would be a lot easier for them to do it as unmarried men. You know, it would be a lot harder for me to do that, you know, to just say, well, honey, First, I have to talk my wife into it, right? I mean, I've, I've had to talk my, my, my porcelain-colored children to go over there and, and deal with the culture shock and everything like that. And, and, and it would be a lot more difficult. But a man who has made himself eunuch uh, for the kingdom of heaven's sake, he, he wouldn't have to deal with that. So I think that's kind of why he's saying, this is a hard saying, and, you know, no, uh, uh, no man can receive it, saying to whom it is given, that it is good not to marry. Now, I will say that that's not necessarily... Entirely true. I mean, it's still good to marry. You know, there's nothing wrong. It's not saying that it is not bad to marry, but it's good not to marry in the light of, you know, if you're going to get a divorce, it'd be better to not marry. It'd be better to not marry than to have a bad marriage. I mean, that's really what we can take out of this verse. It would be better for you to not get married than for you to marry the wrong person. I mean, if you were to marry the wrong person, that could literally ruin your life. It really could. It could, or it severely could. I'm not saying you couldn't be used of God. I'm not saying you still can't, you know, serve God and have joy in your life. But it could severely limit what you're able to do. You know, the Bible says that the pastor is supposed to be the husband of one wife. A deacon is supposed to be the husband, or you know, the husband of one wife. So if you got married, well, that's that's off the books. I mean, that's off the table right there. You know, there's one thing you can't do. I'm not saying that's everything. If you don't do that, you can't do anything for God. But it would be better for you to not marry than to marry the wrong person. Because marrying the wrong person, that person can make you miserable. Mm -hmm. And I've seen it. And I've known people in my past where they have ruined, they've married the wrong person and it's ruined entire ministries. It's a ruined entire, it's, it's brought churches down from somebody marrying the wrong person. So, you know, another example would be Christians marrying unbelievers. You know, a Christian doesn't have any business in the world marrying somebody who is not a believer in Jesus Christ. Exactly. And the Bible is very clear about this. It said in 2 Corinthians 6, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? You know, you should not marry an unbeliever if you are a believer. That's a recipe for disaster. You know, that's why when people are considering marriage to somebody else, they need to sit down and have these conversations. What, what do you believe about going to heaven? What do you believe about the Bible? What do you believe about roles as husband and wife? What do you believe about child rearing? What do you believe about where are we going to go to church? What, you know, are we going to go to a Baptist church? Are we going to go to a Catholic church? And some people say, oh, it doesn't matter to me. But you know what? When kids come on the scene and relatives get involved, hey, you need to get that kid baptized. Oh, my parents are really on me about going to the Catholic church and getting and getting little Johnny baptized now. Well, I'm a Baptist. Well, you married a Catholic. And now you have this tension in the home. Now you have this battle. You know, and people get divorced over stuff like that. And that one thing leads to another. And you end up, you know, worse off than if you just not married that person. You know, if you had just, you know, gone and found somebody who believed like you. And that's why if you're contemplating marriage to somebody, you need to have these serious conversations. You need to talk about these things before you get married. Because you need to find out if you're marrying the right person or not. You know, that warm, fuzzy feeling isn't enough to go on. I'm, you know, the warm, fuzzy feeling should be there. You know, the, the butterflies in the stomach and the weak in the knees and all that, that's great. But there needs to be a, a mature, you know, uh, serious discussion about life. Life's big issues before you decide to marry somebody. When it comes to these topics, child rearing, 
you know, church attendance, all this stuff. This is stuff that needs to be worked out before you say, I do. Amen. You know, it's better to marry than to marry the wrong person. It's better to marry than to have a bad marriage. I would say, I mean, a bad marriage can always be healed. A bad marriage can always be made good again. But a lot of times it never happens. And the Bible talks a lot about, you know, <laughs> about, uh, about, it says it is better to dwell in the corner of a housetop than when with a brawling woman in a white house. Right. That's what it says. It would be better for you to go out into the corner of a housetop than to have this great big mansion and, and have a, a woman in there that just wants to brawl, just wants to fight. Everything's a fight. And they're, they're out there. There's, there's women like this out there, I'm telling you. They're all, they're all sweet and nice, you know, and then it's I do, and then it's like, you're, now you're going to have, now you're going to say, well, here's how things are going to be, and now it's a fight, and now the fight is on. You know, and, and hell hath no fury like a woman's horn. And then, and, you know, instead of you want to go and slug it out, you know, verbally every, every day, or sometimes even physically, I mean, people come to blows with one another, that can happen. You know, you'd rather be up in the corner of the house stuff. That's where you end up. You'll end up in the man cave up in the garage. You know, just drinking and watching the game. You know. It's better to dwell in the corner of a housetop than with a brawling woman in a wide house. That proverb said that's twice. It says that twice in Proverbs, in 21 and 25. It says in Proverbs 21, it's better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and angry woman. Why do you think deer camp is so popular? <laughs> Why do you think men love camping and hunting and fishing? I'm kidding. We love it because of the outdoors and stuff like that. But there's guys like that. They want to get. They're like, I've got to get away from the get away from the wife. And they'd rather go out and sit in the woods with no electricity and no plumbing and into the in the elements than with a contentious and angry woman. I'm telling you, it's better not to marry than to marry the wrong person. It's better not to marry than to have a terrible and miserable marriage. And you know, people marry people they shouldn't have married. They, they, you know, they, and they suffer the consequences. Yeah. You know, I'm sitting down, and I'm writing this story or this sermon, and I'm thinking about the story that I had when I was a locksmith just a few years ago. I got called on a call after hours. I had to show up, and I had to be very stealthy about going there. I'm telling you, it was in this beautiful neighborhood, gated community, great big mansions, just million dollar houses, and this couple's getting a divorce for whatever reason. And the, the property, the caretaker's there. He's the one that called me out to change the locks because he showed up to do some routine maintenance on the house. Everyone was supposed to be on their vacation homes in you know, the tropics or Italy or wherever they were. I mean, really wealthy people. And no, he's thinking, well, nobody... So his job is to go around and take care of these homes while they're vacated. You know, run the water, make sure the lights are off, make sure no one's breaking in, that kind of thing. He shows up, wife's cleaning out the house. She's got the moving truck backed up, big burly guys walking around just loading everything up. And he says, what are you doing? Cops get involved. they got to put it all back. They're threatening him. She's got the movers like trying to intimidate him. He calls us to come change the locks. I get there. He says, park across the street. Don't let him see you. And by the way, do you carry a gun? <laughs> I'm like, yes, I do. He's like, good. I need to get one myself. I mean, this is what happens. And these people just are at complete turmoil of one of their lives are getting turned upside down because they married the wrong person. Because they married a, a brawler. Because they married, you know, they picked a loser. It happens. And people suffer consequences for that. The Bible says a continual dropping in a very rainy day and a contentious woman are alike. Whosoever hideth her hideth the wind and the ointment of his right hand which berateth itself. You know, you don't want to marry the wrong person. I know we're kind of picking on the ladies, but, you know, Mother's Day's coming. So there's going to be the nice, gentle sermon. Don't worry about that. But this can apply for men too. I mean, all this can go for them. I mean, it's not like it's I mean, the men are always, uh, you know, blameless in these situations. But you know, uh, women they set the mood for the home, don't they? Yeah. Women really set the mood for the home. You know, as the wife goes, you know, that's why men are to honor their wives and to love their wives, to put them on a pedestal in the home, and to give them the things that they need so that they can set that proper mood in a home. Because a continual dropping in a very rainy day and a contentious woman are alike. You know, if you get, get on the wrong side of the way, you know, and, you, and you're just not, you're going to have to be at odds with one another. I mean, it's just like somebody just drip, drip. You know, you're laying in bed and all you hear is just drip, drip all the time. It's going to keep you up. So a lot of marital conflict, you know, you know, it would, you know, it would resolve itself even in a bad marriage. Even if it was a bad marriage, people could still resolve the conflicts in their home if they would observe their biblical roles. I mean, that's the one thing. If people would just get on the Bible, if they would both agree that we're going to observe our biblical roles and do what the Bible tells each of us to do, 
they would have a good marriage. And I don't care how bad the marriage was in the, in the past. You can still recover that marriage. You can still have a great marriage if the parties involved want to observe their biblical roles. That's how it's going to take place. Now, you can thank feminism today for the divorce rate. Okay? Yeah. And I'm going to read a little bit from this article because I got curious. Who is to blame for most of the divorce today? You're right, because is it men or women? Well, it says here some new data from this divorce, from this, this is from Psychology Today, okay, 2015, this was a study. Some new data about divorce and non-marital breakups contain, uh, contains an unexpected finding. And I think it underscores the fact that we are in the midst of an ongoing evolution and that people want and seek in their romantic relationships. And there's some crap in here that I don't agree with, but he says this. The study based on a survey of over 2,000 heterosexual couples found that women initiated nearly 70% of all divorces. Did you hear what I just said? 70% of all divorces, it's initiated by the woman. She's the one that wants the divorce. And yet there was no, and it just, you know, the article goes on and uh, it says here, uh, these clinical observations are consistent. Uh, women are more likely to initiate divorce because the married woman reports lower levels of relationship quality than married men. So it's the women that are dissatisfied in marriages most of the time. They're, that's the reason why they're the ones that are initiating it. It says here that uh, in contrast, uh, uh, that men are, they're more, basically it says that men are more likely to just kind of go along and get along. They're, they're just kind of content with, you know, that's fine. But what was, and one of the things, I don't want to get into a lot of it here, for sake of time, but he says one of the big contentions that women had, the, the, the dissatisfaction that they were experiencing in their marriage, is that men were, they were, uh, most of their husbands were expecting them to do the bulk of the childcare, to do the bulk of the housework and the meal prep and the housekeeping. Men were actually expecting women to behave as the Bible tells them to do, to actually be keepers at home like the Bible says. And we say, well, that's, you know, but here's the thing, men are also expecting those same women to go out and work. They don't, they're also expecting them to go out and get a job and do both do both the man's role and the woman's role. So it's really no surprise when a woman says, you know, gets upset. Because neither of you are observing, you know, your biblical roles. The man isn't taking care of, he's not being the head of the house, he's not being the provider, he's not taking care of her and providing her needs like, like he should. He's not, you know, if anyone, I understand we live in a society today where, where it's harder for a single income to support a household, believe me, I know. But you know what? I've been in times where there's, we've been strapped, but guess what? I never asked my wife to go work. Never said, you know, when we first got married, before we got this understanding, it was about six months before my wife gave birth that she went and worked as a hairstylist, which is what she was, when I, what she did when I, when I met her. But that was it. She hasn't worked in years. She hasn't worked since before the birth of my first child. And there's been times where it's like, hey, it's beans and rice, you know, and we're, we don't know how we're going to pay the bills. But guess who went out and got a second job? Me. I went out and worked 70 hour a week. I did. And that's what a man needs to do to provide for his house. So is it any wonder when a man comes home and says, well, I put in my 40 hours, and so did you. Now would you please go make me a meal and do the laundry? I mean, can you understand why a woman might be a little peeve at that point? I mean, I can. But that's, that's the problem today, is nobody's observing their biblical roles in their marriage. And that's why women are very quick. And you know, you can thank the no-fault divorce laws Thank you, communism. Thank you, Russia, communist Russia. Thank you, communist California, for ushering no-fault divorce, where you no longer have to go and pay an exorbitant amount of money and plead your case to a judge to get your divorce granted. You can just go in there and say, I want a divorce. <coughs> and and it's, it's very easy to do today. You know, women are, are initiating most of the divorce, yes, but they're doing that because uh, women are getting divorced because, uh, you know, they want to marry men. Like real men, like real men, whether they realize it or not. You know, and men want to marry women and not men. I mean, men want to marry a woman that's going to fulfill, a, a, at least they should. I mean, it, we as God's people should definitely feel that way, that we want men and women to fulfill the, the, their, their biblical roles. You know, and I know I'm kind of going on here, and i got to wrap this up, but, you know, the biblical roles for women are very clear in Scripture, and men, that women are to be keepers at home, that they're to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, to obey their husbands. Amen. That's not a popular message today. Well, you know what? That explains why so many people are getting divorced, isn't it? Because women do not want to obey their husbands. And you know what? But men also aren't fulfilling their role. 
They're not honoring their wives. They're not cherishing their wives. They're not loving their wives. They're not nourishing them as their own bodies. As even Christ loved the church. You know, willing to sacrifice. To give up their toys. To give up their what they want in life. What all the things that they want to do. To go out and provide for their wives. So she, so she can fulfill the role that she needs to fulfill. You know, and insisting that women follow their biblical model. Their, their biblical role. It doesn't lessen their worth. You know, there's, there's a big difference between, uh, you know, um, gender equality and gender roles. You know, just because we're saying that roles, that genders have certain roles, we're not saying that they're unequal. We're just saying they have different roles. That surprise, men and women are different. You know, that, I'm sorry I have to, you know, it's, it's shocking that we have to actually make that point today to say, guess what, men and women are different. But apparently we do, especially this generation that's coming up. They don't seem to understand that. You know, that's why you see women walking around you know, and they want to be liberated, they want to be feminists, but what do they end up doing? They end up looking like a man. Yeah. I guess the definition of feminism today is to look like a man. To sh cut your hair short, you know, to, <coughs> to put on a lot of weight and just walk around like this, you know, and you get the Bart Simpson haircut, and, 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 and just act and walk and talk like a man. And that, and it's disgusting to see that. And they, I love it when they, because they, I see them, I mean, I, just by nature, I'm already just like looking at them like, <laughs> what's wrong? And I, I have, I'm sure I have a look on my face, and if they catch me looking at them, they, a lot of times they're just like, <laughs> just like, look, you know, gaining all that weight doesn't make you strong. Mm -hmm. You know, that doesn't flex. Sorry. <laughs> you know, I'm serious, but that's what they do. Just like they just become obese and they think that makes them look like a dude. Now they look like some dudes, right? Yeah. But that does not make you a man. <laughs> I, just, I, I gotta move on. <laughs> All right. Wow. You know, here's the thing. A lot of people get divorced. They have, they think they have bad marriages. And you know, they, this is like some, you might consider this very callous or very crude uh, marriage advice. But here's the thing. It could always be worse. That's some of the best marriage advice I've ever heard somebody give. It could be worse. Because a lot of people are coming and complaining about their spouses. He's not this. He doesn't do that. Well, does he go out and work a job? Yeah. Does he let you stay home and take care of the kids? Yeah. What's your problem? He's doing, he's doing everything that he's supposed to do. Yeah, but you don't understand. He does, well, you know what? Shut up. Stop complaining. He, he does, it could be worse. Is he cheating on you? No. Is he gambling? Has he got a drug addiction? No. But women, you know, people will come and complain about their spouse. Just, and you know what? And they don't realize how good they've really got it. And it's sometimes I think if people would just, you know, focus on the good in their spouses, the good things that they're doing, and understand that it could be worse. And I know that's just a real easy thing to say, but it's the truth. It could be worse. Now, um, let's move on here real quick, and I'll try to wrap this up. I know I'm going long tonight, but you know, it's an important subject. I mean, divorce is something that needs to be talked about because it's running rampant today. Yeah. You know, and there's, and there's, there's children in the room and, and, and singles in the room that need to hear this preaching and understand how severe, you know, what divorce is and how important it is to find the right spouse. So, uh, you know, forgive me for going on a little longer, but I thought it was important to do so. So he says here um, in verse, uh, let's just jump down to verse... Um, Verse 16, And behold, there came one and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, and that is God. But if thou wilt enter life, keep the commandments. Now, that's true. If you keep the whole law, if you keep, you you know, whosoever shall keep the law, you know, uh, shall live of the law. I mean, you can live. If you can keep all the commandments and never break the commandments, you can go to heaven. It's true. The Bible teaches that's one way into heaven, but guess what? All of sin and come short of glory of God. That's right. And that's what God, that's what Jesus is trying to get across this young man. That's what we have to understand going into the story. And another great thing is here is that he says, there is none good but one that is God. You know, why callest thou me good? So this is a good one for your JWs, right? You say Jesus isn't God. You say, well, is Jesus good? Well, yeah. They're not going to say, well, no, Jesus wasn't good. Well, if you say he's not God, then you say he isn't good. Right? Does that make sense? Anyway. To say Jesus isn't go God is to say he isn't good. He said in verse 18, He saith unto him, Which? Because Jesus tells him, you know, keep the commandments. He says, Which? He said, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt commit adul thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother, 
and thou, and, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man saith unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? And you could just start to see the pride and arrogancy start to bleed through this young man. You know, all these things, he doesn't get it. You know, I mean, Jesus, if you've been following and listening to Jesus like he ought to have been, you know, if you're if, you know, calling him a good master, you get the impression that he's know, familiar with Jesus, you would have known that, you know, even to look upon a woman of lust, you have committed adultery over in your heart. You know, that it's it's beyond just a letter of the law, you know, that that uh, that we've all come short here. He goes on and says in verse 20, Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. So, I mean, I'm sure Jesus, if he wanted to, could have reminded this guy some other instances where there were some other sins in his life. But this was probably like the most glaring, <laughs> easiest one that he, that he pointed out. And it was his covetousness. His unwillingness to part with earthly goods. That he, he just could not let go of his riches. And it just shows that this guy had a very covetous heart. And he's showing this guy, look, I don't care how good you think you are, we've all come short of the glory of God. The Bible says, whosoever shall keep the whole law, yet offend at one point, is guilty of all. So this young man was covetous. He was a, had a covetous heart at the very least. He was covetous. And uh, Jesus points that out. <coughs> and then it goes on in verse 23. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. <coughs> So that's a that's a hard saying. There's another. There's some hard sayings in this chapter, isn't it? And it says in verse 25, when his disciples heard it, they were exceeding amazed, saying, "Who then can be saved?" I mean, they understood, you know, what Jesus was getting across that that, that this was a hard saying. And that, I mean, to sit there and say, "A rich man shall hardly enter the kingdom of heaven." I mean, it says it's like trying to put a camel through the eye of a needle. What a picture! You know, I mean, it would be easier to do that. And for a rich man to go to heaven. And the Bible warns us a lot about riches. And, and you know, and why is it that riches, why is it that rich people or very wealthy people are going to have a harder time getting saved than poor people? It's because of pride. It's because of this, this idea of being self-sufficient. You know, they've never taken a check. They've never had to add, they never begged for money. They never had to have a relative or a friend help them out, make rent or whatever. They don't have that humility. They've never gone through that. They're very proud. They're very self-sufficient people. You know, they're the ones that, you know, made something of themselves. You know, they started with nothing and amassed this great fortune. They did it all through their, you know, their labor and their sweat and their toil and, and their mind. And they're very self-sufficient. They, they've got a very uh, proud attitude. You know, and those are, those self-sufficiency and being proud, you know, those are hindrances to humility. It's the opposite of humility. And, you know, as I said recently, you have to have a certain degree of humility to be saved. I'm not saying you have to fall on the floor and grovel, you know, and, and, and whip yourself and, and, and declare yourself a, a worm, the vilest creature to walk the earth, you know, before, and go to the mourner's bench and send, sp spend six months, you know, proving how repentant you are before you can receive the gospel. But I am saying that you have to at least be able to say, I'm a sinner. Right. And that there's not, not none of my all my righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Right. There is that certain level of humility that's necessary to be saved. And we saw it today, several of us who got people saved today. And where did we go? We didn't go to the mansions, we didn't go over to the foothills of, of Tucson, to the to the gated, you know, driveways and things like that. We went down to the these these neighborhoods over here. Not terrible neighborhoods, nice neighborhoods. I could stand to live there. Yeah. You know, and, and met with people who were not so full of themselves that they couldn't get saved. The Bible says, Riches profit not in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivered from death. The Bible says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower, the righteous runneth into it, it is safe. But the rich man's wealth is his strong city, and is a high wall in his own conceit. People think that it's going to be the riches that deliver them. They can buy off, they can pay off the lawyer, they can buy themselves out of this problem. But when the judgment comes, when they stand before God, you know, all those, 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 those riches are going to be witnessed against them. They're going to rot and they're going to, they're going to be corrupt. And the Bible goes on and on about you know, how we ought to treat rich people. I mean, it's not a, a sin in itself to be rich. It's a sin to desire to only be rich. But what if you're someone who came into wealth, you know, and you get saved, you have this wealth? The Bible says how we ought to address that. In 1 Timothy, it says, Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not 
high-minded, but and not trust in certain, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. That they do good and that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, re willing to communicate. You know, rich people that come into the church that do get saved, they should be willing to take of that money and give it to the to the needs of the church. Amen. That's what it says here. Willing, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. You know, that's a big reason why we should be in church getting to know one another. You know, because a lot of times, you know, it might be that we have a brother and sister in Christ that could use some help yeah. in some area, be it financially or whatever, you know, and, and maybe we could be a help to them. You know, a rich person could come in and, and really help a lot of people out. I mean, some people, they, they get a flat tire. I mean, it's a struggle. Like, i got to find a new tire. You know, the bills are due this month, and they're not going to do but, you know, brother so-and-so, he's there. He's ready to distribute. He had, you know, hey, God's blessed me abundantly. Let me help you. You know, the charity that is, that is supposed to be there. <coughs> they should be willing to communicate. You know, and that's talking about giving of money. Laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to go, come that they may lay hold on eternal life. You know, storing up riches in heaven and not in this earth. It says there in verse 26, and, But Jesus beheld them and said to them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Look, we can go into the wealthier neighborhoods. We can go into Awatuki. We can go into the gated you know, communities, and we can see people get saved there. It does happen. It's a lot more rare, but it still does happen. I mean, you could catch that rich guy on a bad day, which for us would be a good day, right? You know, he, 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 something happened that day. God did something in his life that day that got him thinking about spiritual things. And, you know, we come along, and God can work that stuff out. God can engineer circumstances in people's life to get them to think. I'm not saying force them to get saved, but put them in a position to be open to hear and potentially receive the gospel. Yeah. <clears throat> then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all, and follow thee. What shall we have therefore? Jesus answered, and Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you that ye which have followed me in the regeneration of the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory. Ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Remember in the previous few chapters how they're talking about who should be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Mm -hmm. And we see in the book of John how they were saying, you know, you know, allow my sons to sit at thy right hand. You know, and Jesus said, I can't give that to you. You know, it's reserved to my father to, to give that to whomsoever he will. But they do get this. I mean, don't they get a special place in heaven? I mean, they're going to sit on the, 12, on the they're going to sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes and children of Israel. I mean, these were these were important guys. They got exalted to a pretty important place. But let's not forget where they started. Let's not forget that they get that because one day Jesus walked by and said, "Follow me," and they forsook all. You know, and I'm sure when they forsook all, they didn't have in mind, "I'm going to follow Jesus because I'm going to get able to sit on the throne." They just wanted to be near this man. They wanted to be near. The Son of God. They wanted to hear His teaching. They want to follow Him for who He was. And that should be our motive. Not going into following Christ and being a Christian and, and, and giving our lives to Christ in service for Him. Not necessarily for what we can get out of it or what God's going to reward us for, but just because that's the right thing to do. Amen. And here's, here's the great thing about it. God will reward us. God will allow us to rule and reign with Him. God still rewards us for our labors, even though He doesn't have to. And not only is salvation free, but then we get paid for serving Christ. I mean, the, behold the goodness of God. I mean, it's, it's that great. And he says, And everyone that forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive an hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. But there are first, but many are first that shall be last and the last that shall be first. You know, he's talking about guys like the rich young ruler who in this life has all the wealth has all the possessions. He's first today. You know, he shows up at the restaurant and it's let's clear a table for you. And you know, the red carpet comes out, you know, and, and, and the lowly Christian who maybe doesn't have very much money, you know, just gets ignored. But there's gonna be a, a day in heaven where whoop, the tables are turned. You know, where it's gonna be the last that are first and the first that are last. Let's go ahead and have a word for